Welcome back to Crosstalks. My name is Johanna Koljonen. According to the World Health Organization, 2.5 billion people in the world do not have access to adequate sanitation, that is, over one-third of the world's population. 783 million people in the world do not have access to safe water. This is roughly one in ten of the world's population. Around 700,000 children die every year from diarrhea caused by unsafe water and poor sanitation. That's almost 2,000 children a day dying preventable deaths. Terrible statistics by any standards. Sadly, there are more numbers just like these when it comes to other areas of global health. And the question is, what can be done to fix it? Our last topic of the evening is global health and global inequality. Are we up to the challenge? And to discuss this question, I am proud to present Denis Vogerö, Professor of Medical Sociology at the Center for Health Equality Studies at Stockholm University, Professor Marita Troje Blomberg, Head of the Department of Immunology, Wendergren Institute, Stockholm University, and Professor Lars Åke Brodin, Research Leader at the School of Technology and Health, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. We also have some guests joining us via Skype. If they are with us, yes, there you are, welcome. Bethlehem Mengistu is Regional Advocacy Manager for Eastern Africa for the international NGO WaterAid, calling in from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Welcome, Bethlehem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. And finally, Dr. Manan Mrida, researcher at the School of Technology and Health here at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, is today Skyping in from a conference at the Health University in Linköping. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. In the year of 2000, the United Nations established the Millennium Development Goals, which aim to overcome eight global development challenges. Four of these are expressly health goals, namely these. Eradicating extreme poverty and the malnutrition that goes with it, reducing child mortality rates, improving maternal health, and combating diseases like HIV, AIDS, and malaria. And the other four goals involve things like improving women's access to education, which in themselves are likely to contribute to solutions to the health goals. All United Nations member states have committed to reaching these goals by the year 2015. Then we vogere with only 1,000 days to go, thereabouts. How are we doing? Uh, I'm afraid we are not doing very well. Uh, most of the Millennium Goals will not be reached by 2015, as was the ambition. And for instance, the two, um, two of the goals, maternal mortality and child mortality, uh, are the two of the ones that are doing worst, maternal mortality in, in particular. Uh, so we are doing badly. And why are we doing badly? I think it's because this is not the priority of the world community when we actually do politics. Uh, when the G20 meets, do they talk about child mortality? Is that what they try to solve? No, it's not. It's other issues, of course. So that's one of the reasons. National governments, the same thing. They, they're on their priorities. It's different between different countries, of course. Now but I should ask you all a, a layman's question. Is it because we can't solve these problems? Do we need new knowledge? Do we need new science? Or is it because we just don't want to? We just don't want to. Uh, or we, I mean, the politicians uh, don't want to. I mean, to... to um, decrease the, the maternal um, deaths and, and also child. I mean, there are a lot of, of precautions that you can take, uh, but uh, women and children are, are of lower priority nowadays. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, others have some, some um, specific, other, more specific reasons uh, why the work towards the Millennium Goals is not going very well? Uh, Menon Mrida? Um, or? Uh, thank you. Uh, we just had a conference today discussing about the use of medical equipment. And clearly, medical equipment is not being used where it is required most. As you pointed out the problems, and I'm very happy to get this opportunity to share with you our work at the School of Technology and Health at KTH, mm -hmm. Where we have identified the problems, as you mentioned, water, sanitation, malnutrition, lack of awareness, and more importantly, 70% of the people living in the rural areas having no quality, qualified doctors. Mm -hmm. Another serious problem for you to know is there are too many so called healers who pretend to be able to cure everything, and that's very dangerous. 
And what we at the School of Technology and Health, and my <laughs> uh, dean is sitting there, uh, and I'm happy that I have a boss who happens to be a medical doctor. Uh, and we are uh, working to empower the rural health workers with <coughs> medical devices and ICT tools. Mm. We are trying to bring medical doctors to the patients, to so, the rural health workers where we act, there is an acute shortage of medical experts. So lack of, 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 lack of predict practitioners who could distribute the knowledge that we already have would then be one of the key, uh, the key causes. Uh, Bethlehem Mengistu. Um, I, I do agree with the uh, preceding speakers. The lack of political will is one of the key um, the key reasons that's holding back progress uh, towards fulfilling the Millennium Development Goals. But for instance, if we take the issue of water and sanitation, the lack of recognition of the importance of water and sanitation for health, education, and livelihoods um, has yet to meet, um, to meet the appropriate amount of priority it requires. And this has had an impact in terms of holding back progress towards fulfilling uh, various Millennium Development Goals apart from Goal 7, which directly has to do with water and sanitation. Why do you think that is? I mean, it, it seems, now that you mention it, it would seem like a, a no-brainer that, that water is, is key uh, to, to, to being, that access to clean water is absolutely key. And we, of course, we, we hear these shocking numbers. Why is this not a top priority? It seems like a relatively cheap solution <clears throat> to many pr problems. It is, it is um, very key. Water and sanitation is quite vital to health, education, livelihood, and it's, it's quite integral to human development as well. But the, the fact we have at the moment is 783 million people are still lacking mm -hmm. access to safe water, and 2.5 billion people are lacking access to adequate sanitation. So these are quite shocking figures. And um, if we go above um, the lack of, the lack of, uh, the underlying causes that are facilitating and sustaining the lack of our issues having to do with poor sector governance, accountability to deliver access, uh, lack of prioritization of sanitation, low financing, other sectors are prioritized above water and sanitation. When, when However, you say water and sanitation. Yes, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, when you say prioritized, uh, who's who is making these priorities? Are these local governments uh, in countries where water is a, is a big problem, or is it something that NGOs should be doing differently? The primary, um, the primary duty lies with national governments. National governments are accountable, and they, they have the duty and obligation to provide their citizens with access to safe water and sanitation. Organizations such as WaterAid, uh, international development organizations such as WaterAid, do add value towards government's efforts, but the primary lion's share of duty and obligation lies with governments. And maybe perhaps the international community could help uh, by raising awareness and also shaming countries that under the like Definitely, definitely. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, in most of our countries, uh, a majority of funding for the water and sanitation sector is through uh, foreign aid. So the flow of aid does have an impact on how well national governments are prioritizing and meeting their commitments. Absolutely. Yes, Danny. Uh, an example where it worked very well is if you go back um, 100 years and look at Stockholm, who had a terrible health records then, water was not very good here. But the local government, actually during a period of 20 or 30 years, had as a priority to put water pipes out and clean, provide everyone with clean water. It had a dramatic effect on diarrhea mortality. It also had an effect on differences, inequalities in, in child mortality in Stockholm. So I think the local government is extremely important here. It's not so much uh, bad will, it's that, that it must be a priority of a local government. And the national government can make it their priority as well. I think this is interesting because this is not just, I mean, this is also a practical problem. There are, there are engineering jobs that need doing. So very, very many different sectors of society, certainly very, very many different kinds of students <coughs> mm -hmm. could get involved uh, in their careers uh, with this work. Ashok? Um, it's, it's quite um, disturbing. It's mostly an economical problem. 
if you look, for example, the area, the district in the world who has the highest uh, death rate by newborn children, it's not in Africa. It's the suburbs of Chicago, mm. <laughs> where you have a lot of drug <laughs> addicts. So it's, it's wow. more a social uh, problem. Or, of course, we need economy, but mm. that's shocked me quite a lot. But that, that raises an interesting question. For a child born anywhere in the world today, what are the most important de determinants of his or her future health? Clean, clean water, um, education, and also uh, protection against uh, existing diseases like uh, malaria. If you are in an, living in an area where there is malaria, there are there possibil possibilities to protect you against this so that you don't succumb to different diseases. Mm. Um, what about violence then, for instance, and other, other kinds of sort of social factors that are not immediately, are these factored in as well? Not, uh, I don't think it's that important for kids, it, mm -hmm. it's for adolescents and, and wives, uh, I think it's very important, but for small kids, I, I don't think it's, I think it's uh, water sanitation and education that's very, very important. Why is education important uh, on, a practical, <coughs> on a practical level? What, what does education do to a person's health? I mean, if you if you get malaria and, and you know the symptoms to get when you have malaria, then you can go to the local doctor or, or whatever and get um, treatment or help. But if you don't know why, why do I freeze and why do I have this, uh, then mm. it's more difficult. So then we're talking about very basic kinds of, of education. But there would also seem to be a correlation between education levels in populations in general and life expectancy and, and quality of life there. <coughs> Yes. That, you can sure, actually, sure. that you can actually see. I mean, if you look on the, uh, the decrease in malaria, it's very highly significantly correlated to the existence of mobile phones. So if you know to handle a mobile phone, then because then you can call your husband and say, I, I need to bring my, my child. But then you know, need to know how to handle the mobile. Mm. Mm. Well, okay. Partly the globalization is um, not always a good thing because if you look for example in India and Bangladesh the diseases that starts to dominate there are the western diseases that we have here high blood pressure diabetes for example in India there will be in a few years 150 to 200 million people with diabetes and of course if you don't can read how should you treat it it's yes of course Bethlehem yeah. And another interesting linkage um, I can point out um, in access to um, education um, and also um, water and sanitation is um, it's it's um, well they're 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 interdependent. Um, we have uh, in areas where we work uh, there's an interesting correlation where. Uh, the lack of water um, and sanitation also contributes to towards. Um, marginalizing, for instance, girls' access to, to quality education. The presence of water and sanitation facilities within schools is as important as pens and books. Uh, because when we look at um, girls' retention rates, it's heavily affected by lack of sanitation facilities, especially girls who have reached uh, puberty ages and do require uh, sanitation facilities to uh, manage their menstrual, cycle, their menstrual cycles. So menstrual hygiene management facilities are as important uh, within uh, school environments to ensure retention. When we look at the MDG goals on education, um, it seems uh, what is usually recorded is enrollment rates. Mm. But enrollment rates, as the grades get higher, uh, the, the retention of girls gets um, reduces from year to year. And this is also linked to the fact that um, you know, also linked to gender roles, girls are usually the ones that are um, a lot of the responsibility or having to fetch water uh, walking long hours. Uh, this contributes to girls missing a number of days um, from, their, um, from their classes. So the lack of uh, water and sanitation facilities within communities as well as schools does have an adverse contribution to girls excelling uh, academically. Dr. Menon Mira, would you like yes. to come in? Actually, I'd like to add uh, one point that is malnutrition is a serious problem we see in our work in India and Bangladesh. We see school children are not dying of hunger today in those countries, but they're truly malnourished. 
<clears throat> and malnourished children have difficulties to concentrate. They are lying, lacking behind at school. Actually, if you are not properly fed, you cannot concentrate at school. You cannot concentrate on your education. You cannot acquire knowledge. You cannot uh, get yourself empowered to change your life. So it is very much a problem. With the malnutrition is a serious problem. Marika. So I wanted to point out something in relation to education. Uh, um, when people are now getting good education in, in certain uh, underdeveloped countries, it's very important to, get, to give them good salaries to, to be able to keep them, because we know that uh, doctors, nurses, they are uh, migrating to UK and to the States. So there's a great brain drain in these um, issues. Uh, so I think it's, you have to mm. find some way to keep them. Uh, the education is key factor, I think, in development of global health. And if you take India, for instance, half the female population cannot read. India is one of the countries that doesn't reach the development goals for child mortality or maternal mortality. And there's a link, of course. So if you think about the half of the population where the women cannot read, the difference between the chances of those children and the other half of the population is quite big. And we need to focus on the social uh, gaps in every society because that is one of the reasons why we have failed with the development goals. That has not been in focus. It's actually impossible to reach the Millennium Goals without uh, closing the gap within countries. I'm, I'm starting to understand the problem, though. This is, these are very, very complex problems that are all attached to each other. And now, if I was prime minister of a country and it had an election to win, I'm, I'm starting to see how you would just go, oof, too much, and just try and, and pass it on. So, so if we try to get a little practical, for instance, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, actually, but what kind of money are we talking about here? Is, it, is this astronomically, are these goals astronomically expensive to, to reach? free education for every child in the world is not at all astronomically, um, financially impossible in any way. I don't know if there is a, anyone has actually calculated the sum, but we can surely afford it. The question is we cannot afford not to do it, actually. And it's not sustainable to have uh, a situation where large gaps of, of humankind actually lags behind increasingly. We are when you say it's not sustainable, what does that mean in, in practical? Do you mean that, that it will lead to wars and... And conflict and uh, to differences between people, inequalities, actually, when they are growing, they undermine society. They create violence, conflict, bad tr uh, trust between people, and so on. It's got lots of consequences that, that are negative. And therefore, actually, to have a s sustainable development, it's like in the, with the environmental development. We need, actually, to march forward together. Do any like of you know any numbers? I'd, I'd like to just see, to have anything off the top, or, or comparisons. I mean, we, we seem to be spending, uh, this is of course the classical example, we seem to be spending, we humanity, quite a lot of money on, on fighting wars. <laughs> and I'm sure we could do that cheaper, or maybe use that, yeah, that money more reasonably. We seem to be spending quite a lot of money to save banks that are in trouble. And we, we seem to be, I mean, there, there are certain causes for which it doesn't seem to be very difficult at all to raise numbers that are so large that I don't even know what they mean, trillions of dollars. If we had that kind of money, if we have that kind of money lying around, would it be a reasonable investment? Wouldn't it just be better to pour it into the Millennium Goals? Yes. Uh, the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, who, who did a report for <coughs> WHO five years ago, <coughs> estimated that the cost of global slum upgrading, every slum area in the world, to upgrade that by giving it water, sanitation, a power source, and clean streets, and so on, that would be something like 100, US, 100 billion US dollars. 100 billion dollars for every slum in the world. That's uh, totally. an estimate using local uh, labor force. So you, could, you could do it for that sum. Or, and that would correspond to something like 1% to 2% of the military expenditure during a 10-year period. One in to two globally. percent annually of the, what we spend on arms every year. One to two percent of that would, correspond, would finance a global, global slum upgrading program. So the money are there. It's just that our priorities are not correct. I, I, Lars Hocke. It's, it's also, if we look on the agriculture support in Europe, we destroy a lot of the 
agriculture in the third world countries by investing in supporting uh, mm. an overproducing agriculture industry, both in the States and in Europe. And that is money that could be taken away, I think. The farmers would the be very upset, but they wouldn't be <laughs> dying. No, yes, I see. Uh, Manon Mida. Actually, these are very complex issues. I haven't closely looked at that. I don't have the competence. What I know, the problems are uh, in health technology and health care. Mm. And I, I see there are serious conflicts of interest in the rural areas where I see so-called doctors with no medical, with no real medical education are sitting at the pharmacy and writing at least 10 or 8 to 10 drugs to the patients for whatever disease they come because there is a interest for them uh, because the selling of drugs are generating some income for the doctors, so-called doctors as mm -hmm. well. Similar trend I see at the hospitals, at the cities where doctors working at the hospitals also working in their private clinics. So when we are studying patient safety aspect, we see conflict of interest within the country. The diversity is not only between West and uh, East or South and North. I see tremendous diversity within the country. There are situations and conditions in India or in Bangladesh where we are closely working. We see huge diversity, huge um, differences in uh, uh, spending. Well, uh, certainly, if, if that also, if this uh, statistic is correct, that child mortality is, is highest in, in Chicago, then th this is also true uh, in, in very industrialized nations. So income and health gaps are increasing everywhere, yes. and these are increasing hand in hand. Do you sympathize, all of you, do you sympathize at all with governments who say, well, this is very tragic, but we must look to our own poor first? We have people who are dying, we have babies who are dying in our own countries, we need to focus on that. What is your response to that, to that argument? Mm. Well, um, my response would be in this day and age, it's unacceptable that a child has to die from a preventable disease such as diarrhea in any parts of the world. Mm. That's just an unacceptable fact, no matter where we're placed in the world and the, the sense of accountability in terms of um, saving a child from a preventable death, I would say that's, that's an, international it's an international commitment. And there are human rights commitments made by all governments. So the sense of obligation, I think, is applicable to all. Mm. Any of the others, Marita? The unequality in the society. Uh, I can tell Manon that I, the best equipped hospitals I've seen they are in Bangalore in India. <laughs> they are fantastic. <laughs> Stockholm's hospital is uh, out of. And, um, but, but it's very few people that can attend this type of care. So you must really have an economical stru structure in the country. Mm. And it shows also in th with this Chicago. It's, we have 15% of the BNP in st the states used for health care. But it's very unequal distributed. But I also think there's a lack of communication between uh, um, politicians and, and people actually live in, living in the rural area. I mean, I can give an example. I just came from a meeting where we were discussing global health in relation to vaccine development. Uh, and that was organized by a small initiative called the European Vaccine Initiative. Uh, and there we had people from uh, EU and from the EDCTP, which is the European Clinical uh, Vaccine um, Platform. Uh, and then the EU said, um, now this EVI, they used to, to promote products from the um, preclinical to f phase one uh, and had the capacity to uh, support a good manufactured product to, to a small extent. Uh, now EU said that now we are going to, to support EDCTP because they have all the, the um, platform to do the clinical trials. Uh, so then the question was from the EVI, what, what's the role of, of, of this initiative? Uh, and no one could save. Uh, and then the coordinator of this initiative said, 
who is going, when we are go coming to these large clinical trials, who is going to pay for this product, which has to be produced in a, a proper way? And, and neither the people from EU nor from the EBCDP, they said, well, who is going to, to pay for that? No one knew. So th that's a lack of, of communication, lack of understanding, which I think is terrifying. Well, it also starts to look to me now like as though all of these nations in the world agreed on the Millennium Development Goals but didn't actually earmark any money. And then, of course, it's just nonsen nonsensical. Did they earmark? Did we earmark money for this? Did we earmark enough? No. I don't think they earmarked any money, but it's more like a moral ob obligation. And each country has to live up to its own goals. Some countries have managed, like Bangladesh, for instance, uh, when it comes to child mortality. Other countries have failed like India, doesn't mean that India is not making progress, but it's not making the progress that it was um, wanting to do. And in fact, we have some countries in the world that has actually moved backwards during this period, like some of the countries in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and some of the countries in former Soviet Union. During the 1990s and this uh, after 2000, they have actually moved backwards in life expectancy which is terrible. I would assume also a country like Greece in the EU uh, yes. must be seeing effects of, of the financial crisis. They are now. feeling the effects now. For instance, in increasing suicide rates, that's, I don't know if the statistics is mm. properly checked, but it's been said in the Greek parliament that uh, that's, the increase has been something like 40% in three years in suicide. And it's, it's, uh, it's obvious that economic crisis has got a link with public health. And the best example to study that is probably the crisis after 1991 when the Soviet system collapsed. And we had an upsurge in suicide mortality in several of those countries and life expectancy dropped. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Russia today has got a lower life expectancy than they had in 1965. Uh, so you can talk about a very long period of stagnation in life expectancy. That's because the country hasn't focused on this as a problem. It's just a side show. It doesn't actually enter the center of uh, public debate and, and parliamentary this discussion. This starts to look at me as though this is a question that locally and globally should be front and center for every population. And I mean, if you read the newspapers in Sweden, for instance, you will see a lot of upset about how hospitals are working or, or not working. So this is, there is, I think there is not a population in the world who do not care about these issues, yet it doesn't seem to mm. be. We, are, we seem to be failing in the debate. Why, why is that? Of course, you guys are all participating <laughs> in it all along, so of course you think, if we just did like, like you do, then it would be fine. But, but I, I think I yes. should uh, acknowledge uh, Mengistu and, and uh, um, Ethiopia, because I think you have, are really uh, being very successful, because they put efforts on in sanitation, infrastructure, and education, and I think that uh, it's a country that is really, really developing well. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on this, Mengistu. Yes, Bethlehem, uh, Mengistu, sure. how is, how is uh, the situation in, in Ethiopia? Um, the situation in Ethiopia is very much similar to the rest of the region, the Eastern Africa region. Um, uh, going back to the earlier question you raised in terms of um, financing, mm -hmm. uh, have we earmarked for the Millennium Development Goals? And the, the status on ground is the Millennium Development Goals have been localized. Um, each of the governments, including Ethiopia, have integrated um, the Millennium Development Goals with the national poverty acceleration plans. But still, we're faced with the challenge of um, the challenge of having national plans that are not strong enough, and the the mistargeting um, of investments and the mistargeting of resources, uh, where services are not reaching those who need it most. That's why our recent reports uh, have depicted that there is a large disparity between rural, and urban, uh, between rural and urban access to services, including water and sanitation. So once again, what that takes us back to is the question financing, or is the question the, the ability of local structures to absorb uh, the, the, the financing that's being provided. Well, what does that mean, ability to absorb the financing? Does it mean that, that the knowledge, for instance, to build the infrastructure required wouldn't be there or, or just money disappears? It's, what do you mean? Um, it's, it's once again link, linked to the, the governance systems we have. Uh, most of the governments in the Eastern Africa region are, are following a decentralized form of governance mm -hmm. where 
power devolves from the national to the districts. So when, when power devolves from the national to districts, um, the quality of human resources, the quality of budgeting, the quality of allocation decreases. So we're faced with the challenge of disparities, disparities in, in progress being different at national level where a majority of the investment goes, but the rural level where the investment is most needed is not reaching those who need it most. Okay. I, I think we should try to focus a little bit on on the how of solving this, because I'm, I'm feel, I feel hope is, is being drained very rapidly during this conversation. Marita Troje Blumberg, your unit at the Wendergren Institute has a long tradition in studies of uh, immune responses in human systems, and, and malaria research is one field where you are strong. If we just look at solving a problem like mar malaria globally, and that was one of the goals, how would we go about that? I think we should uh, coordinate things better uh, as it is now. I mean. Um, one of the <coughs> major goals is to try to develop a, a vaccine against malaria. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a competition between the states and, and Europe. I mean, we are trying to elaborate and, and promote the same vaccine candidates, and then we lose a lot of money. I think this should be coordinated much better. And why is that? That is because funding is it's private corporations? Uh, funding in private corporations and, uh, and uh, scientists are very much like this. Uh, they, to some extent, want to have their own career to get the Nobel Prize and, uh, instead of re really trying to, to solve the problem. I mean, we, we know that from, from the flu. I mean, when, mm -hmm. the, when the swine flu really was a, a problem. I mean, everyone worked together and then we suddenly have had vaccines. Uh, and I'm sure that this could be the same for, for malaria and other infectious diseases. But, uh, Even if it would cost you the Nobel Prize? I would love to give away the Nobel Prize <laughs> <laughs> to, to solve the problem. Um, uh, Lars Hoke, Brulin, you have been working for a long time uh, at the School of Health and Technology here at KTH. Is technology being used to, it, to its fullest extent when it comes to solve health um, problems today? I think partly when we look on medical technology, I think we invest too much in very big machines, extremely expensive, and it gives a lot of status to the doctors who use them. But I think we must focus on cheap equipment that could be applied anywhere. And I think KTH have a lot of research in that area. For example, small ultrasound machines that costs uh, 50,000 crowns can give a lot of diagnostics. You have these MEMS uh, technology where you can, for example, find diseases by blowing in a small centimeter. And I think uh, it's, it's important that we try to skip these big systems and invest in very cheap and uh, usable systems, especially if you look, for example, in the problem of uh, where Manan is working. You, you, you can do a lot with a blood cuff and a, a stethoscope there. Let's, let's talk about that. What, what is Manan working, Manan working yes. on? Yes. Actually, I must tell you that uh, in a developing country like Bangladesh and India, ministers are traveling to Singapore or Bangkok for treatment, or they have big hospitals with heavily equipped with most modern medical devices like MRI, CT, just just to have a business purpose. And patients are asked to do all sorts of diagnostic treatment uh, tests, whether they need it or not, just for to recover their money. Instead, we have to look for the 70% of the people living in the village who don't even have access to a blood pressure measuring device, mm. ECG device, portable one. So what we are doing is we are carrying and, and developing affordable, smart, intelligent, easily manageable medical devices with the, which the health workers are carrying to the patient's home, doing the tests <coughs> and connecting to the medical experts in the city because medical doctors don't want to live in the village because there is no money for them. Mm. So we don't want them to be displaced and force them to come to the village. Instead, we want the health workers sit by the patient and connect to the medical expert through video conference system. And ICT tools have that potential. We can, we already have, and we can make more affordable medical devices that we do. We are working with the development of medical devices. We are working with the distribution of the devices that are already available. And 
we are using the connectivity, whatever the connectivity they have in those rural areas, to connect the patients to the medical experts. What does connectivity mean? Is it phones? It, 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 internet connectivity, because mm. sometimes we have only mobile connectivity. Sometimes the patients want to see their medical doctors. For them, seeing is believing. When mm. they see the doctor, a medical ex expert, they feel much better. So we are using video conference facilities, and that is one problem and challenge for us. And we are hoping that it's improving, connectivity is improving, it's getting faster, it's getting more reliable. So our job is to use ICT tools for e-health and e-learning purpose. That is bringing good teachers to the village, teach the teachers how to teach, bringing medical experts to the village, teach the health workers how to look for the patients, how to empower them, how to help them to treat their disease, to, to, to learn uh, disease prevention, and so on. This is fascinating. Uh, Bethlehem Mengistu, could you also tell us about a successful project that you've been a part of? Sure. Um, I, could, I could give you an example of, um, of, of one technology that, that we have utilized that we've found to be fruitful. And the key to any technology is it has to be the right technology for the local situation. And in our work in the provision of uh, safe water, uh, rainwater harvesting tanks uh, have been found to be quite effective because they are appropriate um, to the needs of the people we're working with. And the nature of the technology is it basically accumulates and stores rainwater, uh, which is treated and reused for domestic use. So the, the key factors here are it's being appropriate. People we're working with are living in poverty. They require effective, reliable, and affordable water. So it has to be appropriate and sustainable to their needs. Sustainable um, in a way that it's, it's able to survive unpredictability of context we're working with. For instance, water security is a challenge that we face in many of our countries. So the technologies we put in place have to be sustainable within um, unpredictable context that we're working with. The general approach here is uh, not replacing efforts of governments. As I mentioned earlier, mm. the primary responsibility and obligation lies with government. But our role comes in by uh, demonstrating efforts that can be scaled up and that can be widened so that they can leverage a government's capacity to, to accelerate their, their, um, their, their commitment to, to, um, to provide safe water and access to, to across the populations. What I'm hearing from all of you, really, is that, 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 that something that really works is finding the appropriate level of complexity, yeah. that do not over-solve the problems, but to, solve, to, 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 do, um, to do the affordable solution. It, it, almost a utilitarian approach. It would be great to solve all okay. problems, but you start with the, with the ones that are, that are the easiest and, and, and hope for a snowball effect. Yes. Uh, can, can, I mention, can I mention one interesting work that we, are, uh, we have just undertaken? Absolutely. Uh, there is a company called Sol Button in Sweden, hmm? uh, in Stockholm, and they have developed a device that can treat surface water using solar energy. You just, it, it, it has a plastic, a special plastic that allows both heat and ultraviolet rays, so it, it deactivates the microorganism already at 55 degrees Celsius. Huh. And we are using that, and we are taking the pilot project in, uh, in March, where 100 pregnant women <coughs> will be given 100 of these devices. It costs $100 per unit. It has a life cycle of about nine years. And our goal is these 100 new babies that will be born, they will get clean water for first five years in their life. And this is an interesting project. We hope this will encourage many others and NGOs and perhaps Grameen um, um, microcredit will come into this picture and help people procure on device so that the, the, they can get 11 into 2, 22 liters clean water, warm water for their newborn babies for five years. That's the goal. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So who is supporting this? Actually, this is 50% um, of it is being supported by the company and 50% by our research project. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, do you f what do you feel that the balance should be between medical care and prevention? Marita? No? Uh, <coughs> Menon? Yes? 
Menon Reader. Oh, oh sorry. Yep. Uh, Actually, uh, I, I, I must tell you that I'm an engineer, I, I'm, I'm a researcher, I, I don't deal into, I, I don't focus into issues that is not within my capacity. Very well. I want to develop things and I want to act to bring change directly. The other issues are very big for me and I cannot uh, uh, comment on that. Very well. Uh, and I have to say uh, that I have to go back to my conference now. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Manan, for, for joining us. Uh, thank you very Thank much. You very Goodbye. Much. Okay. Goodbye. Uh, Denis Bogre. <clears throat> the balance between prevention and care must be tilted towards prevention. Uh, it's obvious that if you prevent someone from, from smoking, for instance, and prevent a lung cancer case, it's much more expensive and costly to wait for the disease to happen. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for every disease, actually. It's, in general, it's much, much better method to prevent disease. And it is preventable. Most diseases yeah. are preventable. Very few diseases are actually, if any, is you, uh, are destiny. You can yes. always prevent yes. or postpone. Yes, so. no, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with what was just mentioned because we're, we're currently dealing with, um, with, with a dire fact, which is um, most of the hospital beds in, in the countries we're operating are, are filled with people suffering from waterborne diseases like cholera and diarrhea, which are preventable. But these are um, putting um, a, a huge impact in terms of um, affecting the capacity of health facilities to, to respond uh, towards uh, other health elements. Hmm. I think we may have a question from Skype uh, now, from one of our okay. viewers. No, we don't indeed have a uh, question. Uh, in that case, uh, I would like to ask for the audience to participate. Yes, sir, in the back, please step forward. That's you. And your name and uh, your university, please. Hello, uh, my name is Manuel Weirich <coughs> from KTH University, or Institute. Um, one thing that you stressed in this talk was that it's really important to have the local and at the most national uh, governments or, or institutions work towards these goals. Where do you see the role of international treaties or goals such like Millennium Development Goals after 2015, Sustainable Development Goals, in getting humanity as a whole to raise the standards of, of health um, mm. in the future? Uh, Danny? I think it's very important. <clears throat> and you can take one, the most uh, obvious example is the Convention on Control of Tobacco, uh, where most countries in the world now has signed a, an agreement to, to try to regulate tobacco advertising, pri prices and so on. And it's been very important. Tobacco companies are moving into those countries where the, this is um, least uh, regulated. Uh, so it just shows that an international agreement can be useful. And there are other areas where the same kind of approach is taken. For instance, on, on the alcohol area, there is a discussion about a global framework convention on alcohol. It's not, there is no, none yet, but, and so on. And you can talk about health rights. There's also discussions about conventions about that. We have actually conventions about that health is a human right, it's in the WHO constitution. And I think we need international collaboration. We need, in particular, United Nations and the World Health Organization to have a much stronger say in public health, in, in world affairs. But do you mean it's, it's the role of these, of these uh, international treaties mostly to change norms uh, in cultures and, and per, so most specifically actually among leaders uh, on the world stage? Or, or is it, should, it, should they also be enforced in different, way, in different ways, well, they, financially for instance? Norms is one thing they should do, of course. And the other thing is programs, concrete programs. WHO was heavily involved in eradication of smallpox for instance, and the, the, there is always a role for the World Health Organization. It's an expert organ. It can you do a lot of things, and it has a very small muscle, to, unfortunately. I think, for instance, when, the, when the, the G20 meets and talks about the world's future, why should they not invite WHO mm. and so on, and UNICEF, and have them at the table as well? But I think yes. it's very, very important that they uh, collaborate and discuss with the national uh, government. I can give an example uh, for the distribution of, of uh, impregnated bed nets, uh, which is uh, f funded by global fund and international money. And all these bed nets, they were white. They were sent to, to Africa, and then we came there and asked, why are these bed nets not distributed? 
Uh, and they said, no, no one wants to sleep under a white bed net because that is uh, correlated to death. So then we stained them green and then there was no problem. Mm. So I think you have you, so to really be uh, doing the right efforts, you have to uh, collaborate with them. Not just the appropriate uh, procedure, also at the appropriate level. So yes, to speak. Yes, yes. Port, Partly we have failed also in Sweden because if you look on tobacco, young women start to smoke a lot in Sweden and the lung cancer among young women is one of the increasing deaths that we have in Sweden. Why so is we, that? I don't know. It's we, for, for some reason, we have failed in our concurrence to tell people that smoking is dangerous. <laughs> yes, or they don't care. Bethlehem, Magister, do you have a, a response to the question? Sure. Um, I, I would like to um, respond to um, what, what can we do now, referring to the question you raised earlier in yes. terms of uh, what is the way forward? Uh, the Millennium Development Goals are, are very close to conclusion. Mm. So what should a, a future framework look like? And also taking um, lessons, uh, taking um, the best lessons uh, from the MDGs, taking the best of the MDGs, applying lessons and doing it better in the future. And one, one of the limiting, the key limiting aspects of the Millennium Development Goals was the existing framework was um, were very vertical in nature. The goals were very vertical in nature and the lack of horizontal integration between targets and outcomes and indicators hampered progress to a certain extent. Mm. And this discouraged the collaboration across sectors. You know, collaboration required to secure interrelated development outcomes such as, you know, child and maternal health. So when we look at um, possibilities of what the post-2015 framework should look like, it should take into consideration the best of the MDGs while applying lessons uh, learned from their limitations. For instance, one of the key things that need to be considered is ensuring an inter integrated approach to social, economic, and sustainable development. That is quite key. Uh, promoting transparency and accountability of results is also quite key. Um, hmm. And another key area that needs to be considered is also addressing inequalities in service provision, especially for water and sanitation. Mm. Um, there is growing disparities in, in access amongst countries, even within countries. So inequalities need to be taken into consideration and need to be addressed. But the mm. goals, the, the framework needs to also be ambitious, ambitious in the sense that targets should strive to meet universal access to service, including water and sanitation. Yes, uh, that's great. Th thank you, I think, yes. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? Yes, ma'am, please. Um, <coughs> I, think, uh, I think it's interesting also what you're saying, because I, th I think for in this context of the crosstalks, uh, uh, for people from different disciplines to meet and, and talk is one of the long-term ways of ensuring uh, cross-sector uh, collaboration as well. Yes, please, what's your name and, and affiliation? Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Amina Hinayan Tagaboni, and uh, I'm uh, studying microelectronics here on KTH. Um, I believe that uh, every problem has a solution, and, uh, and to so, uh, solve a problem, we need to understand what the causes of the, the problem. And um, um, I would like to know why does this problem exist now, today, we t today we have uh, reached or we have discovered uh, the Higgs boson, and uh, I think that the reason why we did not solve the, the, the problem with water and uh, healthcare in uh, country in uh, countries like Africa and uh, India is that we are dealing with people, uh, and that's the main problem. Um, I also wonder uh, if there are some organizations or um, parts that are uh, benefiting from uh, these issues. Mm. That's a, two very good questions. Thank you, uh, Amina. Uh, so what are the causes? I, I'm assuming they are historical. Why is this still a problem when we can put a robot on Mars and, and observe the Higgs boson? That's one question. Another question is one, is one part of the answer that there is an industry uh, in, in helping, that there is an interest. I, I, I felt that there was implied, perhaps, that, that there is a lot of infrastructure and researchers and so on who, who earn something from, from these problems not being solved yet. So two huge questions, and we don't have a lot of time. So, so who would like to start answering? Let's okay. Definitely, if you look on, for example, pharmaceutical industry, they want to sell pharmaceutical 
for high prices in the Western world. Mm. So there is in their investment focus. And, um, but it's, that's it's also a, a, a complicated uh, question because uh, industries in, in uh, our part of the world, uh, they are, are involved in the development of new drugs vaccines, which is extremely, extremely costly. Uh, and when you have this uh, second generation of, of uh, products that are produced very cheaply in, in India or um, in, in um, Vietnam, uh, they don't have this investment cost. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. We mm -hmm. discussed this a lot during the meeting on global health. Um, so, but I agree that I also think that the industry is taking too much, and they want too much money, but, but it's a delicate question. Could, could you say that the one part of the problem is that that nobody is making money from prevention, or not, or the existing organisations and so on are not making the money that would that that would be invested into prevention, and it would take this whole other part of the sector of the industry away. Danny, the taxpayer would make money from out of prevention because if you prevent a disease, it's cheaper than <coughs> you have to treat it. So there is lots of money in prevention, but it's actually demands a longer. Talk about preventing cancer. You actually need to think in terms of. A lifetime or a lot of diseases are uh, caused by factors very ba long ago I mean in your childhood for instance so uh, you must have a perspective which is much longer than the normal four-year political perspective it's absolutely necessary to think in terms of a generation or more mm -hmm. to have a successful prevention Bethlehem and Gisto. Um, Another factor um, that is also a key contributor is also um, changing behaviors. Um, in our earlier conversation, we talked about technologies, um, technologies that are intended to improve the quality of life of people. But when we're talking about technologies, um, for instance, uh, having, having to do technologies with water um, sanitation, it's, it's safe water, affordable domestic water, um, improved hygiene, effective sanitation are all linked to uh, improving and changing behavior, which is time taking, uh, which is also linked to prevention. So it's, 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 it's um, like, like the, 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 the person that just raised the question said, w we are working with people. And while working with people, uh, the type of change envisioned has a lot to do with changing behaviors. The good news, of course, is that every little helps. Uh, yes, all of the yes. changes that we that we uh, that you all participate in, in fact, do help changing expectations and yes. and lifestyles. Uh, Marita, yes. finally. Yes. So, so I have a question to you, Jenny. If it's so that the taxpayers would benefit a lot for prevention, and I agree. So how come the taxpayer don't say that we have to to give treatment to uh, many of the infectious diseases like malaria, which are preventable and which cost a lot, a lot of money? So I think the, the taxpayers, we should also raise our voice and say we want to see where our tax money are going. Or what? I agree. Okay. <laughs> you know what? We are running out of time. So I'm going to ask yeah. the four of you, and maybe you already answered this question then. What is one urgent thing that needs doing? Is, is Marita, is your answer the taxpayers need to say we want our money invested better? I think so, yes. That's a great answer. <laughs> yes, and also if we should look on ourselves. Sometimes we are prone to too much status research. Uh, it's to fix clean water is not, uh, you don't get the Nobel Prize for that. And <laughs> one example is, for example, um, uh, the earthquake in Haiti. Every country sent big hospitals there. And they were worthless because uh, they had an infrastructure for healthcare already they have, should have supported that. Instead of sending hospitals, they perhaps should have sent taxi drivers to put the people to yeah. the right place. That's right. So, 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 so uh, we need to look to ourselves and, and yes. question our own, yes. our own motives, especially yes. in research. Yes. yes. Denny? Uh, I, I say that the most important thing for global health would be to education for boys and girls and not forgetting the girls. Uh, that's have a long-term effect on global health. And if you want something symbolic, I say that after 2015, when we now talk about new millennium development goals, global health equity should be one of those goals. Bethlehem and Gisto, final words. What is the one urgent thing that we should do now? 
The one urgent thing that um, we need to do now is, is, is um, it, it's not viewing water and sanitation in isolation, but looking at it as a key development, a key human development issue. And um, there needs to be demand exerted on governments to m fulfill their commitments they have made. All governments have made commitments. Most of our national governments have even made earmarked commitments, like to an extent of setting a percentage, 0.5 of their GDP to be invested in sanitation. But we have yet to see those commitments fulfilled. So, so fulfilling those commitments is, is priority one. Again, we uh, move back to the, to the responsibility of all. Uh, we are running out of time. Thank you so much. Denny Vogere, Marita Troje Blomberg, Lars Hocke Brodin, Bethlehem Mengistu, and Manan Brimida, who was with us before. This live broadcast from Stockholm has come to an end, but don't miss the opportunity to continue this conversation with our guests right after this online. We also warmly welcome you to continue the discussion on our website in the days and weeks to come. Crosstalks will return on May 30th with new and thrilling topics. Until then, work hard, stay safe, and be brave. Good night. <laughs>